made it to Florida, brother. We made it to Florida. And you know, I have this verse that keeps going through me the last few minutes. From It's in John's first chapter. It says, darkness, let's see. The light is coming to the world, but the darkness has not been able to overcome it. Yeah. The light has come into the world. The darkness has not been able to overcome it. The old King James says, the darkness comprehendeth it not. The devil had no idea what God was doing. And I believe we're meeting right now at a time when the devil is attempting to do something and has no idea what God's about to do. That's right. It's true. Now, you're coming in from Bakersfield. Yes, sir. So, now he just, we just caught, caught up a little bit last night. Everything we do is spontaneous. You got to know, nothing is right. rehearsed. No. So you have, but I keep asking you, you got miracles. I'm always seeing uh, like snippets of miracles. Are you going to be able to show us some miracles, uh, videos of what's going on? In a few moments, we're going to show you an amazing video of the healing power of God in the modern age. Yes, sir. Now, I just want to say, Catherine Mullins and the, this wonderful worship team. Weren't they amazing? Beautiful. Clap real loud. Thank them. And uh, if, if they brought any music with you, buy everything. Just buy it all. And, uh, you know, I'm going to stand here for a moment and just tell you, Lance, when the Lord told me that we were to do a tour called Fire and Glory, and I took courage because I had to go up to land and say, listen, this is my idea. I think this is from God. It's not me. And then he agreed to do it. And the first one we did was astonishing. And now look at this. And you know what? Yeah. There's a movement being born in this, this tour. It's not just a get-together. There's a movement. How many of you feel there's a movement of the Holy Spirit starting? Yeah. No, it's, to be honest with you, it, when, you when you're looking forward to a, a big meeting or a conference, it's exciting. But when it's a movement, there's trepidation because there's this element of the fear of the Lord that right. you have. Because I know something about God. I was watching Jack Hayford uh, recently, who was, and you, you've been with all these guys over the years. Oh, yes. And Hayford was at a vineyard meeting, giving them a prophetic warning about not shying away from the inheritance of signs and wonders right. and becoming sophisticated. And he said something that kind of really got my attention. He said, it's almost as though God will show up with revival but does so in a way that leaves you just a little bit embarrassed about what it is that he's doing. Because if you're not willing to be embarrassed That's by right. the manifestation and the visitation of God, then you're maybe your ego isn't exactly in the place where God's revival is going to show That's up. That's right. So we are not ashamed of the gospel. No. We're not ashamed of any subject. In fact, the reason why we do this is because we don't limit ourselves to just say, we don't color inside the margins of what typical preachers do. We believe that because the church hasn't given a message that covers all of life, a whole lot of counterfeit authority has taken up space and has created widespread confusion without accountability. And we believe we're coming to an Elijah moment where the whole theory of wokeness is going to be put to the test. Yes. Yes. And that God who answers by fire is the God of America. Yes. America's about to come to a moment, I'll prophesy this, where it will have to decide either the Lord is God or the Lord is not God, because the only thing that's keeping us together is the unanswered prayers of generations past for God to move in America. And God is now challenging us. Will you push the issue? If you'll push the issue, I will move. I believe God's about to move in America. Now, everybody here that is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, clap your hands right now and throw a shout on top of that. Amen. I want to take a moment right now and ask every one of you to bow your heads. We're not going to lose one ounce of the fire that's in this room. Not at all. In a moment, 
all of you here in the front. What a job you did stomping on the devil's head tonight. It was amazing, wonderful. But we're going to welcome you back to your seats at the end of this prayer. Lord, you know my heart. You know exactly what I want. I don't want fame. I don't want attention. I want my nation to be spared judgment. I want the evildoers to be exposed and the lies that this nation has been forced to believe and the sadness that evil has brought on the masses. So much manipulation, so much evil. We're going to break it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let the power of your word come forth. Let every devil in hell shake at the very thought of what you're about to do in this room. Empty wheelchairs, open the eyes of the blind, set the captive free and do what we were singing about. Break every chain in this room in the name of Jesus. Everybody say amen. amen. Well, I welcome you back to your seats. And I want to take this opportunity to tell you that Mary Roberts of the World Equestrian Center, she is the World Equestrian Center, so graciously has allowed us to come be here in this amazing part of the world. And she says this is God's place. That's what she told me. And I tell you what. I want you to thank Mary Roberts for what she has done. Amazing sacrifice. Clap for her right now. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Her husband, Larry, needs a miracle. Why not believe for a miracle? He needs a miracle. And I, I, I don't think anything is too hard for the Lord. So everybody, put your hand in the air. And Lord, we speak life to Brother Larry right now. That Lord, your healing hand will come in a mighty way. That Lord, what man can imagine and doctors cannot predict, you're able to recreate tissue and cells and do a miracle. And for that, we thank you and we give you the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I'm going to begin now, and I'm hearing uh, some other music besides. This is the music I want to hear right here. The other track, I we'll see what happens. So there it was that in Colorado Springs last July, Bree was carried in. And the reason she was carried in is because she was virtually at death's door. And the only thing I'm going to tell you when we play this video, it's about six minutes long, is that she was at the end of her rope. She only weighed 94 pounds, and she's taller than I am. And that young girl, they placed her in front of the tower of speakers on this side, and she was crying out helplessly. So you'll see her before, you'll see her after, and you'll hear her miracle of how because of a parasites that had invaded her in digestion, she took medication that caused her body to start cannibalizing itself. And before God healed her, well, you'll see it. So maybe we can play that now. and that I thought you came up here to be born again. This thing that's been growing inside of you is dying by the power of God right now. So, so if you're with her, I'd like to both this stand for a moment. I want you to remain right where you are. I know, I know it's difficult for you to move. 
But I want you to listen to me. I want you to stay right there. I need one of the one of the ladies on our work our team to stand with her. She needs help right now. Now, those of you here, please do what I ask. Face this way, breathe in and out. Step forward a little bit. I want her left at the front because she's going to receive a total healing. So, thank you. I said that there was something inside of you that was going to die, that was eating up your life. Tell them a little bit of what that was. <laughs> First of all, evil. <laughs> Second of all, um, I had two, I had gotten two parasites. And because of those parasites, I had to take a pharmaceutical. Um, and that pharmaceutical, I got better for one week. And then slowly after that week, my body just started deteriorating is the perfect word um, and over the course of six years I was just down to skin and bones and it was besides losing yes. weight yes. what else did it do to you? extreme pain extreme pain to the point where I couldn't even first of all if I showered it was a good day I would drag myself to the shower I would cry in the shower because it was so hard to stand up there were days when I would look at my cell phone and I would just want to like reach out to somebody you know and I literally some, like I remember, I can remember looking at my hand, you guys. I would look at my hand and I would say, move, move, and it was so painful. I couldn't even move my hand, like I couldn't even move my arm sometimes, you guys. I would just lay there. It was agony, a absolute agony, absolute despair. Now, Bree, you ended up having to use a wheelchair. I would, yes, I would, I would use a wheelchair, not always. Um, but I would, if I wanted to go out and actually, at the end there, if I wanted to go out and actually be able to go to the grocery store or, I mean, do anything, I would have to use a wheelchair. I mean, I, I got on an airplane to come here, and I was telling my friend Melissa, I said the last time I was in an airplane, this is amazing, I, I was in a wheelchair. And I'm just like, you know, I'm just dancing now. You guys, I didn't dance for years. I would watch people dance and I'd be like, Am I ever going to dance again? Am I ever going to move again like that? It, it was... Now, you heard the words that I told you about your condition. Yes. And you knew they were totally right. <laughs> yes. And then God began to heal you. Describe what it was like to be healed by Jesus. Okay. I'll be as real as possible right now. <clears throat> um... Precisely when Mario ended the sentence, his sentence, I don't remember what the last word was, but, and as soon as he pointed and said the last word that he had said on that screen, I felt the power of God's love come from his hand straight into my body. I collapsed. I, I buckled at the power of this love. I saw, I mean, truthfully, I, um, my, my entire, I just shattered, you guys, everything, everything I thought I was, every, every principality, philosophy, all of that, I shattered, I died, I, I died, and I, 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 this love, I, it just consumed me, and it showed me where Christ, where Jesus, where God, where that love, that protection had been my entire life, honestly, <laughs> at the point of conception. I just saw that him holding me there and, and how he's there our entire lives. And even when we're, every, everything I thought about the world, everything I thought about myself was just gone and it was just him. Well, think about that for a moment. You know, I really want you to appreciate that. She was not just healed. After she was healed, she was born again. I don't think we got to that part. But you actually were healed, and then you received Jesus as Lord. I will say this. When people were coming up to me after, your people were like, what's your testimony? What's your testimony? I was like, 
God's love. They're like, yeah, but what happened? And I was like, what are you talking about? It doesn't matter. God's love is real, and he knows us, and he knows you by name. I was overcome by that, you guys. I was overcome. I was overcome. So, um, so I don't even remember what you asked. Okay. It was not a question, so we can actually move to this part. You began to heal. You're, look at you. Arms, legs. Not only did I heal, you guys saw me eat that hamburger, some of you. I ate a hamburger. Not only did I heal, but I had intolerances and food allergies before I was healed to certain, to certain ingredients I had and that hamburger. Not only did he heal me, but he more than healed me. He went back even further in my health history and for me back. He gained, you know, when a woman will talk about her weight, it has to be God. She weighed 94 pounds. And how much do you weigh now? So I weigh at least 130. Sometimes I bend the truth and I tell people 132. And I say, and me and my brother, we joke about, you know, when I get some love handles, and I say, not only does God give, but he gives in abundance. Somebody give God the glory. Amen. Somebody give Jesus the praise. This is a wonderful healing. Wonderful healing. The only other thing I want to show you is a slide of the altar call that we gave in Bakersfield, California. We had the largest representation of non-Christians in any crusade that we've ever had. We invaded and through Frank Saldana inner city action we visited thousands of homes and you may not realize this that bakersfield is one of the most hard hit american cities for fentanyl the death from fentanyl is consistent and one young man in the gangs dying from fentanyl addiction came forward to be saved and by the way referring back to Bree, she as she said she was not a christian when god healed her she didn't know Christ, and a great number of the healings we're seeing now are among the non-believers as a sign and a wonder from God. And I, I just tell you, it's amazing. Well, so this slide is the moment when I asked the gangsters, the addicts, and all of the, and uh, the overwhelming majority of those who came forward were young men, as I recall, so I'd like to see that slide if we could now. And uh, the line of people to be saved went outside the tent. You can't tell from there. They're standing up there all the way down the end of every aisle. That's a, about a 20,000 square foot tent. And those young men are being saved in record numbers. But I'm here to tell you that I have a message for you from God. And I want you to clap your hands and shout and give God the glory for what he's about to do. Come on. I am not gonna take a minute more than I'm supposed to. But I believe that there is a spirit in this room, the Holy Spirit, and what we have gathered here is a group of Christians, many of whom are very frustrated. David Wilkerson once uh, did a blog in which he described a growing number of Christians. Long before we came to this event, years ago, David put this out in which he described praying people, people who pray. And he said, praying people have started to compare notes and say, this is not it. They're tired of the commercialism and the system of the world, especially coming inside the church. And there is a feeling growing among many believers, and Lance and I are very aware of this. They don't want the flash they don't want the commercialism. They want an actual moving of the Holy Spirit. So somebody talk to me, right? 
And so what I'm going to do is take a moment and be very courageous with you. I want you all to know that if you are here tonight, you don't know Christ. You are not here by accident. No one has ever heard me preach the gospel by accident. Not one lost soul that I've ever led to Christ ever listened to me by accident. God worked it out. You may not have planned it, but God did. I even believe that you're seated right where you're supposed to be seated. I believe the people around you are there by design. In fact, I'd like everyone to take a moment and look at the person beside you and say this to them. Say, you must be a genius. And tell them, because you decided to sit next to me, you must be a genius. So the people of God are frustrated. The people of God are frustrated. Pastors and leaders are frustrated because there is this fad that has so dominated us for so long and while we were looking the other way, wokeness stole our country. The church was supposed to stop it, but teaching and doctrine and tradition got in the way. One of the things that I love about Lance Wall now is I don't know anyone who has more precision in understanding the times that we're in. But on the same token, I am in another department telling you that what I see in the church is that there's going to be a separation. The saints of God are going to separate from what I'm telling people is the eagles are going to leave the turkey yard. That's what I'm telling you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand right now. How many of you understand what I'm saying? There was a moment where I was told that the lost cannot handle a noisy church service. I was told that you needed to tone it down and you got to shorten it and do this. But the gangsters don't care about that. They don't care how long the sermon is. They only care if it is anointed or not anointed. And you know what I believe? I believe that many, many places, the control of what church does has been taken out of the hands of the Holy Spirit. And one of the great needs in this hour, am I preaching yet? Is that we need to once again surrender to the moving of the Holy Spirit. Let him move the way he wants. I once wrote in a book, Vessels of Fire and Glory, that before there can be a great awakening, there must be a rude awakening. And this morning and last night, I couldn't get Abraham Lincoln off of my mind. And I want you to understand why. Before he was president, when he was running for the Senate, he delivered a speech entitled, A House Divided, in which he described America. The way he described America is precisely where we are right now. And he said this very important statement. He believed that America would either have total slavery or no slavery. But he said the idea that we would have free states and slave states will never work. America will not last if the polarization that we're in now between blue states and red states gets any worse. And God's not gonna allow it. So we're either gonna, we're gonna have to decide. We're gonna have to decide right now. Here's the first decision I want everyone to make. You are no longer a spectator. You're a soldier in the army of God. I'm gonna try this side over here. You are no longer a spectator. You are a soldier in the army of God. I'm gonna try it one more time. You are no longer a spectator. You are a soldier in the army of God. So we need to go through a reprogramming, a reevaluation, 
And the word that I'm going to give you is this. In his speech, he said this. In my opinion, the nation will not cease until a crisis shall have reached and passed. Lincoln was trying to prevent the Civil War. In his speech, which was panned, I knew it was from God because the New York, even back then the New York Times didn't like it. And Lincoln said these words. He said, look, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved, but I do expect the house to fall, and I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Now I'm going to look at you. America is down to two choices, woke tyranny or Christian reformation. Now, I'm going to try it again. Woke tyranny or Christian reformation. It's going to be one or the other, but it won't be both. What God has begun to do in America proves to me that what God will do will not allow wokeness to survive. That's his intention. Now, why is that important? I want all of you to listen to me. It's important for all of us to understand that not every Christian is awake. Now, this is the cure for wokeness, is being awake. Not every Christian is awake. Not every Christian can be trusted to do what God wants them to do about what's wrong in America. And you have to see the two schools of thought. When you hear believers and preachers and authors and lecturers in the church that say all of this is in God's hands, he's got control of the entire situation, and, and we just need to sit back and watch God work. They don't understand the Bible. That is totally not in the Bible. What is in the Bible is that since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. God has given mankind, the church, a role in the restoration of America. And the Christians who believe that we don't have a responsibility, we need to be trained, we need to be aware, we need to be awake, we need to be filled with the fire and the anointing of the Holy Spirit in order to bring this nation back to God. Now, it's not enough to be a conservative. All of you conservatives that love Trump, I'm going to lead you to Christ. All of you conservatives that love Trump, I'm not going to be happy until you're not only saved, but baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in a heavenly language. How many of you want the Holy Spirit to fall on us? Raise your hand. Lincoln said this in the beginning of his speech, if we could know where we are first, if we could know where we are and whither we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. That's this weekend. Souls are gonna be saved. Bodies are gonna be healed. But also something else is gonna happen. I believe that God wants to create an Azusa Street type event during this event for his fire to fall on us to such a degree that we will be in prayer, we'll be under the anointing, we'll be filled with the fire of God, and we will break the strongholds of demons that are trying to rule our nation. Somebody said it. How many of you believe God can do that? God tells us 
that the same words that Lincoln used are in the Bible. If we could know where we are, whether we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. 1 Chronicles 12, 32. The sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. So here is what Lincoln did. He did four things. He said, number one, where are we? Where are we? If we knew where we are. Number one, America is divided. And our children are not supposed to be being taught perversion. They're not supposed to go to school under our watch with our taxpayer money and listen to an old man in a sundress read them a story. There's no version of that that works in my world. Look, that's not a negotiable. Somebody said amen right now. The pharmaceutical companies of America need to be brought under the judgment of Almighty God for bringing an opioid epidemic, for bringing a fentanyl epidemic, and giving us shots that don't work and that have poisoned us. And I'm praying for Donald Trump. I'm praying that two things will happen to Donald Trump. And I, I have a feeling he's going to know I said this. Number one is, I want him to get a revelation about the vaccine. And number two, I want him to get a revelation that there's nothing wrong, Mr. President, with being on fire for Christ and being baptized in the hope. Somebody help me right now. How many of you believe we can have a spirit-filled president in the White House? How many of you believe we can? Number one, where are we? We're divided. And it's not a division that we can solve in the natural. You see, I'm telling you, Christianity is going to be here. Jesus said on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let me tell you, the church is going to make it. You, you despots, you media, you liars, you people that come against Christianity, that attack pastors, that try to shut down churches, you might as well put on a tinfoil suit and play with fork lightning because this church is not going away. This movement is not going to die. This Bible is going to survive. We will have a church. We will have a Bible. We will have the Word of God. And it's going to be in our schools. And it's going to be on our streets. And we're going to watch God flow like a river into the ghettos of America and prove Himself faithful. I believe that God is going to give me souls wherever I go. Souls that are going to be saved. You know what else? I have a saying. I said, look. Christianity will survive without America, but America will not survive without Christianity. Now let me tell, look at you. Where are we? We're at a point where it's, we, can't, we can't decide. Yamara, you're going to start a firestorm. You know how many hate emails you're going to get after this sermon? I wish I could tell you that I care because I don't. Uh, Sometimes I wish I was a little more uh, sensitive to that stuff, but I could care less. I'm not worried what the left is going to say about what I preach because I'm too busy getting this nation back to God where it belongs. Somebody, glory to God. All right. Where are we headed? Lincoln asked, Where are we? He said, Where are we headed? Without Christ, this nation is headed for disaster. Without Christ, we are beyond a political solution. Do we need to be involved in politics? Yes. But what we need to understand in our involvement in politics is that God wants to give us all an anointing to bring influence into all the areas of Christian life and American life, whether it's secular, whether it's business, whether it's education, entertainment, wherever we are, we are to have a powerful infusion of life and wisdom and authority. 
This is what I think has happened to us. Where are we tending? We're in debt. We're being, we're being made morally flabby so that we're easy pickings for China. We're being manipulated to the way instead of being aware of decisions made on our behalf. I'm gonna tell you what else. I believe that inside of church that I'm begging the pastors of America, many are watching live stream across the US. I'm begging the pastors of America to wake up and start preaching the unadulterated, unapologetic word of God from your pulpit. What we've done is condemned millions of Christians into a life of recovery. There is an inordinate relationship. Many in certain pulpits now are gurus of self-help. And you can't tell what they're saying from the strip in a fortune cookie. And people don't want it. Young people have made it eminently clear by showing up in record numbers to see the Jesus Revolution and sit through a film that has no, no fluff, no lies, nothing, just tells them about Jesus. American youth are ready to hear about Christ. Let me go on. How many of you still love me even though I've said all this to you? Where are we headed? We're headed to a point where church will not be safe without the anointing. Church will not be tenable without proper instruction and getting people out of themselves, getting them out of the introversion that we've done, both in some of our worship choruses. This is what I love so much about what all of the songs that Catherine picked tonight gets you out of yourself and into him. And it's not about woe is me and I need, if you don't help me, I'm toast. No, we need songs that tell us we're going to defeat the enemy. We're going to stand against the tide of culture. We're going to make it. We need hymns and anthems of power. And so how do we get out from this turning in, thinking of ourselves? The gift of prophecy is essential. We need to restore it. We need to bring it into its proper balance in the body of Christ. Because there are too many false prophets now who are giving words from God on a daily basis as if it were a horoscope. Instead of looking for someone to give you a daily word, open your Bible I'm going to try it again. Open your Bible. It's either going to be Christian revival or world tyranny. That's where we're heading. So what should we do? Because he said, if we knew where we were, where we're tending, then we'd know better what to do. But here's what we got to do. Because of social media, the spirit-filled community has gotten the terrible habit of faking moves of God. They promote them. They advocate them. They say, we're going to have a revival. You don't have a revival. A revival has you. And in the moment that we're in, we have to understand this. We need the gift of prophecy. It's because I love it that I want it purified. Because according to 1 Corinthians 14, when it is, the unbeliever will fall on his face and declare that God is in you of a truth. Today we need to quit worrying about trivia. There are too many people hung up on titles like apostle and prophet. Quit it. Here's what Paul said 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. I think that you, sir, need to quit using the label apostle and function in the gift. Show us you're an apostle, not by telling us you're an apostle, but by the miracles and the growth of the work that you're doing. I don't want anybody organizing the church into some apostolic order. God knows what he's doing by the power of the Holy Spirit. I think we all need to look, how many of you know I'm in trouble now, but I don't care because I want my country to be saved. Now, next, what do we need to do? Ladies and gentlemen, what we need to do is find common ground. Let's not circle the wagons to the, this camp over here, this camp over there, this camp over here. We need to be very discerning today of what God is saying. We have to understand what pleases the Holy Spirit so that he'll move in miracles and in the supernatural in all of our meetings. I know that, that a visitation of God is already in progress in America. I know that right now, churches are already being visited by God in a mighty way. But there is a separation. Those that want the carnal version of it are being put aside. Their ministries, their anointings are suddenly being put on the shelf because they're refusing to understand and discern the time that they're living in. Let me show you the other side of that. God wants to reveal to the body of Christ how we make a difference. And it's a word that God gave me that is, has been absolutely one of the most important words I've ever learned is the word firepower. I'd like all of you to say, say firepower. Firepower, firepower is defined as the total amount of force you can bring on the enemy. It doesn't matter how well I can preach or how well you can preach. Doesn't matter how big your church is. It does not matter how many gifts you have in reserve. Firepower is what does what I believe and who I am do to the evil around me. Do I have an effect on it or do I not? Through social media, we've been able to fabricate false Christian victories and turn ourselves away from the ones that matter. You know that I don't even feel safe outside my tent. When I am anywhere else but inside of my tent that's filled with prostitutes and drug addicts and homeless people, is the only time I feel real because I can watch God destroy the works of the devil. Now, let me tell you something. This virtual reality that we've gotten into in the body of Christ. Abigail said to King David, you do only fight the Lord's battles. We were singing tonight this is how I fight my battles. I listen to you. We have many warfare songs and we've had them for years. The problem is that there was no context of where does that work itself out in changing the culture. Because it's changing the culture that God is really after. God is trying to clean up the streets. God is trying to bring the homeless back in. God is trying to have an impact where it matters. What I want for you is this. I want every one of you that are listening to me to become the devil's worst nightmare. Now, I'm going to start here. I want you to become somebody that literally wherever you go, however you go, the presence of God is on you. 
The word of the Lord is in you where you've gotten over your past. You've recovered from your habits. You're no longer going to church to survive. You're not fearing that you're about to backslide anymore. That your obsession in your life is this. I am on this earth. I am called of God. I'm anointed of God. I'm separated unto God. And I will be used of God in an extraordinary way. And let me, somebody clap for Jesus. Amen. Firepower. Firepower is the actual damage you can do to the enemy. How much force can you bring to the enemy? That is firepower. It's not in words. I do believe that we make up virtual reality battles in order to avoid our responsibility to change the nation. That's why we must be involved in politics. This is what I believe uh, Fire and Glory is going to do. Listen to me. Fire and glory is going to bring together an alliance by the power of the Holy Spirit between aware conservatives and spirit-filled believers. And in concert, both of them are going to come into a river of unity that's going to flow across the nation. And you're not just going to hear a, a pastor get up and just talk spirituality. He's going to know legislation, procedure. He's going to know how to go to a board, a school board meeting and speak down in the name of Jesus and stop the woke dead in their track. There's something powerful coming. How many of you want to be a part of it in Jesus' name? How many of you want to be a part of it? Number one. Firepower is the total number of weapons and ammunition that you have in your arsenal. That's a military definition. The second definition of firepower is the destructive power of those weapons. How much damage can your weapons and ammunition do? That's your firepower. Third, the skill level of your warriors and your tactics. So not only is it a matter of how many weapons you have or how powerful they are, but how skillful is your plan and your soldiers in executing against the enemy. Here's what we've done. Some pastors and leaders are getting it. And there are so many that I'm so proud of. I'm telling you across America, there's a breed of preacher coming on the scene that's going to know how to actually do harm to the devil. Now, and that's happening right now. Now, I want to get to the final point. And I want you to understand that I have asked Jesus to pour out his spirit during this event and to ignite in you gifts that you have ignored, to give you the proper balance to them. There's one thing that Satan does not want the American church to do, and that is the proper use of supernatural power. I saw it with Oral Roberts. I saw it with Catherine Kuhlman. I believe we're going to see it again. But I think that a, a purity in the flow of divine healing is coming to the body of Christ where it doesn't glorify a man or a woman, where it doesn't end in emotional excess, it doesn't end up in financial or moral scandal, but it glorifies Christ. How many of you want that? Tell me you do. How many of you want that? Tell me that's what you want. So I want to quote this verse. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds. Now look at me. If the passive crowd that abuses the sovereignty of God in doctrine, if they're right that it's all in God's hands, 
then what in the world is that verse telling us? That verse has to be held as pure heresy. If God does not have a meaningful, practical role for you in the transformation of America, if there isn't a level of power left for you that you've never known, if you aren't being recruited by God out of apathy, out of confusion, into an active role in what he's doing in the world, then this verse makes no sense. It borders on child abuse because it says the weapons of our warfare, not God's warfare, our warfare. God is looking over the ramparts of heaven and said, I'm giving you weapons for a reason. I gave you a Bible for a reason. I'm not wanting you to just sit there and passively watch your children ruined, your life stolen, and your days on earth become futile. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Say amen. amen. But they are mighty. Say amen. amen. And what are they to do? Tear down strongholds. Tear down strongholds. And, and it's truly an amazing moment. I want to I read it in the Amplified because it's very important. The weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God to the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings, you see what's happening is there are two men that I noticed, Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson. And they stole our thunder. They stole your thunder, they stole my thunder. They said all the things the church should have been saying to the woke. They said about abortion what we were supposed to say. They said about the Bible what we were supposed to say. Neither one of them claimed to be Pentecostal. And yet millions of people are listening to the seeming irrefutable wisdom. But Jesus has reserved the real source of that for the church. He said in Luke 21, I will give you a mouth and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to gainsay nor resist. Now the Bible says refuting arguments, tearing down strongholds. I want to announce today, I want to tell the devil something. I'm going to look him right in his face and tell him the church is waking up to their weapons, waking up to their power, waking up to their role in the last days. We are not a mamby-pamby, divided, weak. Glory to God. We are a formidable force in the earth. Clap your hands, all ye people. Before I finish, I'm going to give a public appeal. I'm going to talk to people about their soul. How many of you give me a few more minutes to finish this? But see, I had a goal. I had a goal in mind for this sermon on firepower. One is to tell you you're not crazy. When God woke you up in the middle of the night, began to tell you how your neighborhood could be transformed, you are not crazy. That was God. Pastor, when you felt that urge after church, when you left frustrated, wondering, what, what am I even doing in the ministry? And you got alone with God and suddenly began to hear things about how God was giving you a territory to believe was something you had authority over. And you were going to release souls from darkness and you were gonna see resources come for you to do that. You're not crazy, that was God. When you left a Christian concert with a bad feeling in the pit of your stomach, like what was that even all about? There was no altar call, there was no endeavor to seize that holy moment when you've got thousands of Christians together. Shouldn't you be instructing them on how to get their country back? You're not crazy if you have that emotion. You're not crazy if you have that conviction. If you're an older person and uh, the devil's telling you you're getting ready to gum applesauce at Leisure World, 
time to fold up your walker and just start walking in the name of Jesus. Start moving your joints. Start standing up and saying, I'm, I'm gonna, I've got time on this earth. I still have a work to do for Christ. I'm not done yet. Church, church, I'm trying to mess you up. Tomorrow morning when we begin at 10 a.m., it, it's time for you to realize you better buckle your seatbelt. You're going for a ride. Yeah. You're going to come out of this on fire. You're going to come out of this possessed of a divine vision. And fear is going to go away. So I'm looking at you. And I'm going to kill another sacred cow of the church. Because uh, they make the most delicious hamburgers. It would be ridiculous for us to worry about the time. We were in the lobby of the World Equestrian Center, the main hotel, and one of the leaders from here walked up to one of our leaders and said, listen, if something like what happened at Asbury starts, we want you to know that the World Equestrian Center doesn't care how long you're in that building. We don't care. <laughs> Said it. If you end, if you end up praying all night, we don't care because that's how much we want it. You know, I wonder if some of you in this room have a deep enough hunger yet, a desperation yet. Are you? Are you there? Are you getting there? Where you're gonna say, God, I'm tired about reading about revival. I'm tired of everybody telling me about how great Azusa Street was. I just want it in my time. I want it in my day. I wanna be in it myself. Are you ready? Because that's where we're headed. That's where we're going. That's where we're gonna land. So forget about the time. Because we're going to do two more things, three more things, actually. But I'm going to do this one first. I want to destroy that myth that you can't preach a sermon like this and then give an altar call for people to be saved. You just can't do that. Because no one's going to come forward. That's what they tell you. But, but that, the fact that that's false is not an accolade about Mario. That's not a compliment about me. That's America. America wants God. Americans want Jesus. Man, in Bakersfield, I remember when a leading drug dealer interrupted my preaching, had a massive bag of marijuana butts. I mean, the expensive stuff. He had a huge bag of it, came up to the front. Security thought he was going to attack me. And man, they, they stood next to him, see what he would do. And he pointed at me and he, he said, look, stop. He said, I need Jesus right now. I can't wait. I got to have Jesus right now. <laughs> then he threw all of that marijuana buds on the ground and started stomping it in front of us. moment I'm going to have you bow your heads but before you do I'm going to gently speak to you I, I have no doubt that there's going to be a firestorm started by some of the things I said tonight I have no doubt but I haven't had a firestorm in a while I started getting lonely for one but I want you to watch something
the gospel of Christ, the message of Jesus, is the greatest thing that any American ever heard. They've never heard anything as great. The fact of the matter is, if you're a psychiatrist and you're trying to help people get over anxiety, depression, and suicide, and you leave Christ out, you are not a sincere healer of people. If you believe that women are equal to men and deserve all the rights that the Constitution, you consider yourself a true feminist, that women have rights and they ought to be defended, and you leave Jesus out of that narrative, you are not sincere about women's rights. Because no one in history ever championed the cause of women like Christ and Christianity. Now let me move on. You may believe that we are a systemically racist nation. But if you sincerely want racial equality and Christ is not in your strategy, you really don't want equality. Because not only does Jesus take racism out of the heart like no one else, when he's done with that person, they don't even remember what color the other people are. I want to look at you for a moment and I want to tell you something. You are hurting. And the, the root of your hurt is not explainable. The feeling that you are lonely is not the product of being isolated because you feel it just as much when you're among friends as you do when you're by yourself. There's something else going on. Modern life has created a low-grade hum, an annoying noise that's inside of the spirit of modern Americans. And they can't figure out why their last waking moment is so painful and the fear that hits them when they get up in the morning. We've never seen a day where Americans have felt more like nobody really cares what's going to happen to them like they do now. There's no safety net. There's no sense. And the most dangerous part of all is that the Bible said that in the last days the battlefield would be the emotions. More than anything else, the battlefield would turn to feelings. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, they'd be unthankful, unholy, ungodly, and ungrateful. And we look at those words and we don't read them right because in the original language, it speaks of an emotional condition where you literally lose the power to heal from a past hurt. You know, there's a, a side effect of a certain kind of diabetes where if you get a cut, it won't close. There's a form of emotion that's the same way. The Bible said unforgiving, meaning incapable of resolving a past hurt doesn't heal it sticks gratitude doesn't mean you left a lousy tip it means ungrateful you've lost the capacity to feel beauty to be grateful at all to find anything in your life that says to you I'm a blessed person ungodly is the most dangerous because it is a free-floating hatred of God that cannot be explained. And it is something that drives people. 
Now, I'm going to tell you what it means to serve Christ. What does it mean for you to get out of your life of pain, of emotion, of loneliness, of hurt, and get into Christ? What does that mean? It means that you first forget what you've heard about what it means to be a Christian. It doesn't mean you believe in Christ. It doesn't mean you believe you go to, that you go to church. Just because you walk into a donut shop, you don't turn into a policeman. And so where we miss it when we talk to people about their life, where we miss it is we tell them, we want to change your beliefs, and we do. We want to change your doctrine, and we do. But we don't understand that after the miracle is when you do that. It's the miracle that comes first. Imagine a moment where all your fear vanishes. Your fear of tomorrow, your fear of your life, the idea that there's no rhyme or reason, that your life is a cruel joke. All of that goes away. In a moment, I'm going to ask God to put a hunger in you to be honest that you've gone to church, believed in God, but you have not yet had the miracle. The miracle that I pass from death to life. The miracle that I'm not the person I was before. In the translation of the book of Philippians, chapter 2, it says these words. It is God who gives you the power to change and the desire to change. Every other time you've tried to get off drugs, off alcohol, away from pornography, or to recover from hatred or abusing somebody you love like your wife, those programs you've done over and over and over again of self-improvement have failed because the, the first step was you. It wasn't God. When God moves towards you and says, I'm going to begin a project in you, I'm going to give you the desire, I'm going to give you the power. I'm going to give you the power to say no where you've never been able to say it before. I'm going to give you the power to agree that by surrendering and giving me that proper place in you that all these feelings are going to be replaced love joy peace long suffering patience things that are the result of Christ having his rightful place you see he can't be a system of belief alone he has to be the engine that drives your choices and the only way he can become that is what we see. We read something in the Bible as if it were a high-level consecration verse. It's not. It's not a secondary graduate school Christian verse. It's an entry-level verse. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. And be not transformed to this world, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The mind that you have now is hurting you. The emotions you have now are hurting you. The feelings you have now are eating away at your future. And now it's time for a new day, a new power, a touch from God. He died for you on the cross to save you from eternal separation from God in hell. NBC News asked me one day, define for me the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. NBC News. I said, let me tell you what it is. The devil makes you suffer. And every day without God, you suffer more than the day before. And what you get from life when you don't know Christ is hell to go to hell on. And I can't think of anything worse than to have hell to go to hell on. 
but the reverse is the truth. We, we don't wait to have the proper blessings of heaven till we die. We get them the moment we we're born again. We begin, we begin to feel heaven. We get a foretaste of heaven. In Hebrews it says, we've tasted the power of the world to come. Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world give. So already you're going to get a peace of mind that is incapable of being counterfeited or artificially reproduced anywhere in this world. And joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Heaven to go to heaven on. Hell to go to hell on. Heaven to go to heaven on. Bow your head and close your eyes. I'm going to ask you a question, and before the enemy will rob you of your moment, you need to listen to me. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in a moment and say, Mario, I'm raising my hand because I want you to pray for me. Pray for me that right now I will have Jesus and joy and the peace and the miracle that you described, that I will not only get the will to change, but the power to change. And I will not go to hell, but I will go to heaven. And I will repent and I will do what God wants me to do with my life. Now, I cannot pray with you if I don't see your hand. So I'm going to ask you right now, wherever you are, I want the miracle you're describing. Raise your hand right now, wherever you are in this auditorium. If you think you're by yourself raising your hand, you're not. There are hands going up in everywhere I can see. And I don't want you to keep your hand down. If this is your moment to let me pray with you for Christ to transform you, get your hand in the air right now. I want everyone with your hand raised to stand to your feet right now. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up wherever you are. Get up on your feet wherever you are. I, I submit. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that tonight we had a sermon about revival, about separation, about taking America back, and then we gave an appeal for souls. And I want you to see what the Lord has done. I'm going to ask you, and it's very important, don't rob yourself of the greatest moment of your life. If you're on your feet and you let me, you want me to pray with you for Christ to give you a new life, that's why you're on your feet. I want you to find the nearest aisle and walk up here right now. Come to Christ. Every one of you are standing. Every one of you who are standing, come to Christ right now. Come from wherever you are. Fill in the front right here. We're going to wait for all of you. We're not going to we're not going to stop until all of you have come. There are already hundreds of people on their way to Jesus. There are already hundreds of people on their way to Jesus. Workers, help me fill in the back. Right here, bring them across the center. Come, fill in. Church, you better clap real loud. This is an amazing moment. How many of you believe this is what it's all about right here? This is what it's all about. Keep coming. Keep coming. Fill in all the way in the front. This is a historic, epic harvest of souls. still coming. Keep coming. We're waiting for you. Now, would all of you who are standing in the front please put your hand over your heart.
I want to warn you of the importance of faith and repentance. That word repentance is often left out of the modern terminology, but it is repentance that activates the miracle. When Jesus began his ministry, he, it said that he began to say, repent and believe the gospel. To repent is a 180 degree turn from your way to God's way. There's no neg negotiation. It's God's way now, not mine, it's his. Don't waste energy trying to figure out how your Christian life is going to unfold. Focus on the first step and watch God begin to orchestrate your growth in Christ. So we begin, we repent, then we believe. We believe that habits are gonna be broken. We believe that our name is being written in the book of life so that when we die, we are not going to hell, but we are going to heaven. We believe that the devil's authority over us ends now, that there is a formal transference from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. I believe these things, Mario. I believe them. Now you're ready to pray. If you need to say this out loud, I'm going to ask the audience to join in out of love for the people. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Son, of Son of God, I see you on the cross dying for me. When you died for me, you proved that you loved me. Three days later, you rose from the dead, proving that you have the power to change me. Change me now. Put that supernatural life in me. You are now the Lord of my life. Wash away all my sin that I freely confess. And I thank you, Jesus, that you have come into my life forever. And every day of my life, you are going to lead me, teach me, strengthen me, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Now I want everyone to hold your applause for a second. We have got a vast harvest to take care of. And God will not be pleased with me if we don't take proper care of these people. See, to God, it, it's glorious to God how many have been saved. But it's also important to God that we treat them with the utmost love and concern. We can't just get numbers. We gotta, we gotta help them. And I want all of you that have come forward, and there are so many of you, I want all of you that have come forward to understand that we value you as an individual. Jesus sees you as if you were the only one standing up here. And your hurts and your burdens and your concerns are very important to God. That's why we want someone to pray with you. And believe me, we're going to need everybody we have trained and then some to pray for them. Now, what I need to know is where are we sending them? All right. How many aisles do we have to send them there, Steve? Seven. Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you all to... Listen to me, we're gonna turn around and face the audience because we got one more thing to do as you march out. You're gonna march out? Remember, we're saving your seat. Your seat, you're gonna come back in this meeting because we got one more thing to do. And two more things. 
But I want all of you to know that there's an aisle over here, there's aisles, and you're gonna go down the aisle that you came down, back to the back. We only need five minutes of your time. You're gonna meet with a Christian leader. We used to call them counselors. I don't call them that anymore because you don't need therapy, you need Jesus. So we don't call them that anymore. Not, and I'm not criticizing anyone that does. Man, am I gonna get an email about everything? So I'd like you to know what we're gonna do. Turn around, face the audience. You're gonna march down the aisles, start down the aisles, all the aisles. Church, stand up and welcome your new brothers and sisters into the family of God. I wanna hear some loud applause. I want you to thank God for them. How many of you believe that revival is starting? The harvest is already here. Come on, church, clap. Love on them. What a night, what an awesome beginning this is. What an amazing response in Jesus' name. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Don't you love it when the harvest takes this long to gather it all in? What a glorious thing it is. I, I, I'm sorry, we gotta keep clapping right here. We gotta keep rejoicing. How many of you thank God for souls? How many of you thank God for souls? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Boy, I tell you, hallelujah. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you something, folks. You need to pray for me, and I'm gonna tell you why. You need to pray for me because we're buying a new tent. We bought a new tent. And it's almost as big as this hall right here. Yeah, and I'm, I'm real nervous because our new tent can seat 5,000 people. And we're going to fill it every night in Jesus' name. Wherever we go, we're going to fill it. I think we need to give God the glory one more time. Everybody, we need to give God the glory one more time. I want you to be seated for a second. I've got something i got to tell you. Okay, how many of you are still not watching the clock? Good. You know, I'm gonna tell you, there's something in this room that's very special. I don't feel it often, but I do now. I didn't feel it a moment ago, but I do now. And I'm gonna tell you that uh, when this meeting is over, the last thing you're gonna remember about it is how long it was. What you're going to remember is what God did for you. Now tonight, God proved to us that America is ready to be born again. And we need to start preaching soul-winning sermons again. Because Americans want to be born again. There are many people in this room 
who are being healed by the power of God right now in your body. And because of the glare of these lights, which uh, I don't mind because I'm getting a tan. that normally I can feel an easier connection with the audience. And during the night, that's bothered me a little bit because I, I, can't, I really can't feel the connection like I do in my tent because of the, uh, the lights, but I don't want them off. That's not why I'm saying that. But all of a sudden, I did. All of a sudden, I did. And one of the things I'm going to tell you is that cancer, diabetes, blindness, the sicknesses that I am describing are being healed in this room. Now look, I'm going to count one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. There's a lady right there on this aisle in white in the seventh row. You're wearing white. Yes, wave your hand at me. Stand up for a moment. In the glare of this spotlight, you look surreal to me, but I'm going to start. Is there anyone with you tonight? You're being healed, aren't you? Right now. Put your hands in the air. And all around you, people are being healed. You're not just the only one that's being healed. The people around you are being healed. But dear, when you put your arms up, all of the joints in your body begin to be healed by the power of God. Neck, shoulder, arms, legs, knees, ankle, all of it. Wave your hand like this. Move your neck from side to side. Whatever, whatever you do, enjoy this moment because you are out of pain for the first time in a great deal of time. You're healed. But now, near you is heart disease. Near you is diabetes. Near you is someone with, with a constriction in their lungs. And I want all of you to be healed in Jesus' name. What you want to do, I need a couple workers over there to help me. And there will be a flowing of the Holy Spirit. Lay hands on them. Watch them as they're healed. Over here, look at me. O over here, look at me. There are five people. This section, I've got to differentiate this. There's this section, there's this section, there's the outside section. Is there an aisle there or is this all one section? Right here, five of you that are suffering severe pain in the spine, neck, and chronic headaches. I'm talking about migraine headaches. I'm talking about people that were in car accidents and their neck their jaw, their back. Every one of you that are over there that fit that description, I want you to stand to your feet right now. Do it immediately. Stand up. Stand up. You say, well, Mara, that's plenty of people. No, that's not all of them. I'm not going by how it looks. I'm not trying to get off the hook here. I'm trying. There's one more lady with a hip condition that did not stand up. Get up right now. There she is, right there. Somebody, give God the glory, not the man, Jesus. Now, we're gonna put the body of Christ at work. If you are near any of these people, wait a minute, there's one more man. You didn't stand up. You have back condition, leg condition, you have diabetes and heart disease. 
You have all of those things and you need to get on your feet right now and be healed in the name of Jesus. And there he is. He just stood up right now. Give God the glory. The power of God is starting to flow. Jesus. Now, if you are near any of these people, lay your hand on their shoulder and the power of God will heal their body in Jesus' name. I bind cancer in the name of Jesus right over here. I'm pointing at you. I'm going to tell you, you are being healed in Jesus' name. You need to get up on your feet and let God give you a miracle. There they are. I pointed right at them. Step into the aisle right now. Folks, the power of God is starting to fall in this auditorium. Everybody needs to raise your hands, pray in the language of the Holy Spirit. I need one of our prayer warriors, and I know they're all working with souls. But you, let me see you. Sir, right there, left hand in the air, three, four, four separate places in your body. This is going to feel like fire. Put both your hands in the air. Yes, sir. Four areas in your body that what chemotherapy cannot do, the power of God is doing. We give you the glory, Lord Jesus Christ, for the power that's flowing through this. Yes, pray for it. The last time I felt anything like what I feel right now was in the Maybe Center in Tulsa. And I feel like there's power flowing. Look, over on this side, five of, excuse me, seven of you with migraine headaches. Seven of you with migraine headaches over there in this entire section. Stand up right now. Just get up. Get up. It's so real. One, two, three. Stand up right now. They're further back on this side, right over there. You're being healed. Get up. Receive this. Thank you. Receive this in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Receive this in the name of Jesus. Put your hand on your forehead. Be healed right now. One of you has a special case of this that leads to suicide, and you're being healed of that right now. I can't take it anymore, folks. There's too much power in this place. We need to pray in the heavenly language. Just, there's a river of God flowing through this auditorium. There's an absolute river of God spirit flowing in this auditorium. Cancer is being healed. You know, I've got to tell you, there's someone that fell either off a ladder or in a stairway. I'm trying, I'm going to go with, you fell off a ladder, landed and crushed the base of your spine. You're over here and you're being healed and the pain is leaving your body for good, not temporary. These are not temporary. Get up on your feet and let God take that pain out of your body. There's no doubt in my mind that Jesus, I praise you right now. Once again, I need everyone to get up on your feet just for a moment. We got converts coming in by the hundreds back into the building. Raise your hand right now, get ready for a mass demonstration of the healing virtue of Christ. Pray in the language of the Holy Spirit out loud. Louder, louder, louder. Yes, right there. Hold that, hold on to that. God is healing your stomach. God is healing your lungs. God is healing brain tissue dementia by the power of God. It's flowing out of this building. It's flowing out of this building to people that are watching by live stream. God is healing. Somebody's invalid. Somebody is invalid and the power of the Holy Spirit is falling on. Keep praying in the Spirit. Don't let go of this. Don't let go of this. Diabetes. Arthritis cancer miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle it just keeps flowing
Growths are vanishing. Lumps are disappearing. Legs are getting stronger. Numbness, paralysis, skin disorders, allergies, blood disease. It's powerful. It's happening everywhere around me. There's no doubt, there's no doubt. There's a visitation of the Holy Spirit. It's not a man. We must give all the glory to Christ. We must give all the honor to Christ. We must give all of the honor and the glory to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Listen, the presence of God is getting stronger. It's not me. I'm not saying this. I'm not manipulating anything. I'm discerning it. The presence and the power of God's Spirit is intensifying on people. Shoulder is going back into place. Someone that needs hip replacement, God is giving you a hip, giving you healing. Begin to clap your hands right now. Begin to clap your hands right now. We must glorify His holy name. We must glorify His holy name. This is your chance right now. This is your chance for the Holy Spirit to take over this meeting completely and not an agenda of any man, but only the agenda of Christ. We give you the glory, my Father and my God. I'm going to tell you my problem. You need to understand my problem. I'm aware of many, many things that God has said is happening to people. I'm aware of a businessman with an ulcerated stomach that is in the heat of a court battle. He can't sleep at night. He's wondering what's going to happen to his family. And God is literally reaching into his body and healing his abdomen right now. It's as real as anything I've ever heard. There's a poor woman whose right side is inflamed with pain. You're in this section over here. Your right side is inflamed with pain. I'm talking about the shoulder, the hip, and the leg, and especially the feet. At night when you wake up, the pain in your right side can be so intense that you'll scream. You wake up, feel the pain, and scream. God wants to end your misery right now. In fact, he's moving on your body to heal you. So many healings are happening that I, I can't enumerate all of them. Diabetes right here. Right there. Put your hand over your eyes. The person that is on the far side, almost on the end with diabetes, put your hand on your eyes because it's your eyes that are all, your sight is being restored. I'm telling you, there are things going on in this room that are, that are Christ, all the way in the back, all the way in the back. You, sir, kidney disease, right over there. And your kidneys are being restored in the name of Jesus. You say, Mar, what are we going to do with all this? What are we going to do with it? Yeah, there he is. And you're being healed, sir. This is going to be your deliverance from dialysis in the name of Jesus. That's right. So much power flowing. So much power falling. People are being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Over here, over there, there are people being filled with the Holy Spirit, receiving a heavenly language. Man, I can't take any more, but I'm going to take as much as I can and then some. But I want all of you, how many of you thank God that He's moving in this room right now? How many of you thank God? 
fire and glory. Scoliosis, epilepsy, eczema, severe depression, pain in the stomach. Over here, there's a woman with pain in her stomach and the doctors don't know what's causing it. And you are not crazy. That pain is real, but it's gonna be gone in Jesus' name. Now, everybody listen. If you need a miracle in your body, why not let's allow the Spirit of God to do a mass miracle? Why don't we allow the Holy Spirit, and I say that word carefully, I don't mean allow. Why don't we surrender and let the Holy Spirit bring a mass miracle of healing, baptism of the Holy Spirit, the fire of God, demons being cast out, miracles of every kind. If you need a miracle in your body, if you need the Holy Spirit, everybody that needs healing or the Holy Spirit or deliverance, put your hand in the air right now. There's a miracle coming. If you have your, if you see someone with their hand beside you raised, even if your hand is up, put your hand on their shoulder. Everybody's going to have to do double duty. That's how much need there is in this building. Now, before you do anything else, I wonder if I could talk to you about what you're about to do. You're about to declare a miracle over a person. And as a result of that declaration, their sickness is going to go away. And because of that declaration, somebody that has never been baptized in the Holy Spirit is going to receive the Spirit. So that being the case, I want all of you that are here, I want every one of you that are here to repent of unbelief. Repent of it right now. Just to say, God, forgive me for thinking I'm just going through the motions right now and nothing's going to happen. Everyone can put your hand down. But if you have your hand on someone, on their shoulder, you're going to declare a miracle. And God is going to do it. People that are watching, live streaming, healing virtue is flowing out to you too. And now, wherever you are, whoever you are, wherever you're standing, you're putting your hand on someone and you're going to believe these signs will follow them that believe they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover begin to pray over them begin to pray over them follow this line of thinking follow this line of prayer Lord bring healing on them right now I'm a child of God I'm standing on the virtue of the word of God I'm taking the authority of a spirit-filled believer who believes in miracle. And I thank you, Lord, that these growths vanish, this spine straightens, these eyes open, these deaf ears are unstopped. These legs will function normal. Virtue, healing, power. Virtue, healing, power. Miracle faith flowing everywhere, flowing all around me flowing in the name of Jesus, flowing with greater force than we could have possibly have predicted. Ulcers are vanishing, lumps are vanishing, limbs are straightening, power is beginning to flow, healing is occurring, people are receiving from the hand of God. That's a miracle. That's why you're shouting, you've been healed. Join me in praying in a heavenly language. Power, power, power from God. Power over sickness and pain and disease and malignancies and infections. Every curse of the devil is broken over these people, lifted off of them, taken off of them. In 
Kelo Moria Reba Sata. Now you can put your hand down and just ask God for more. Say, I need more of you, Jesus. I need more of you, Jesus. I want more of your presence, more of your fire, more of your anointing. I know that I'm filled with the Spirit, but I want to overflow in the Spirit. I want the presence of God. Right now, ask Him. Say, Lord, let me feel your glory, your fire, your glory. Let me feel your presence, Lord. Let it come as never before. Let it come, oh Jesus, upon me. Man, I'm telling you, He's reaching out to you. God is reaching out to you to touch you. It's wonderful. It's glorious. Absolutely glorious. How many times we've come so close? How many times we have ventured beyond the veil and then pulled back? And we feared what might happen if we fully gave ourselves and we became a living sacrifice. This is where memories that last a lifetime are born. These are the watershed moments of surrender that will mean more to you than anything else. Jesus. I want everyone to be seated in the presence of God. And I want you to close your eyes. I want you to wait on the Lord for a moment. Jesus. I feel the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. And I believe he's telling us to not be afraid to go in deeper into God. Don't be afraid of surrendering to the Spirit of God. Everybody pray right now. I'm telling you, everybody pray. It's Spirit of God is coming on this man. There's something very sacred that is taking place right now. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm going to tell you we're going to do something right now that's going to bring glory to Christ. How many of you want to bring glory to Jesus? Raise your hand. There are people that have been healed tonight in this room. Some were healed by a word of knowledge that I, God in his mercy allowed me to give them. Some were healed by the laying on of hands. Some were healed just simply because they were in this atmosphere. Because Christ is in this room and we give him all the glory. But what I want you to do is to think of a psalm where David said in the 40th Psalm and in the 10th verse, I have not withheld your mighty acts from the great congregation. He said, if you did something for me in the great congregation, I didn't withhold that information from the people. The Bible says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So I'm going to ask if God healed you tonight, if Jesus healed your body, if he touched your body and healed you, would you stand now and give God the glory wherever you are? Stand right now. These are God's trophies of healing right now. Come on, 
clap real loud. Thank God for these miracles. Thank God for these healings, Jesus. You may be seated. One of the things you're gonna learn about the Fire and Glory Tour is we don't leave anything out. We don't talk about politics and leave out supernatural signs and wonders. And we don't talk about supernatural signs and wonders and leave politics out. Because it is a new day, ladies and gentlemen. The, the Democratic Party has turned into a cult. There's no doubt about it, it's now a cult. And I, I had a believer say, well, are you telling me I should leave the Democratic Party? I looked at him and I said, don't you realize you've been asked to leave? I mean, I don't know any clearer mandate to get out than the one they've given us. We don't believe in your God. We don't believe in your freedom. We don't believe in your morals. We don't believe in your church. We don't believe you have a right to raise your children the way you want. We don't believe you get to say what you want. I don't know what, what kind of self-loathing you would have to stay and sign up for more. And so in the Fire and Glory Tour, we're not gonna leave out the anointing. We're not gonna leave out the information you need about what's going on. You're gonna get it all. And these, this full, complete counsel of God is what ends up starting a movement. So I'm gonna welcome Lance Wall now here near the end of the meeting. Would you welcome him back on the stage? Here he comes. Come on, clap for this great man of God. And I'm gonna Hello, my friend. What a wonderful night this has been. Well, what I'm going to do is tell you, brother, this tomorrow is going to be amazing all day. And uh, I'm going to give him the microphone. I'm going to put mine over there. And I feel the Holy Spirit is still working in this room. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you know what? You don't have to play anything. We'll give him a break. We're just gonna sing for a second. I'm getting a little drunk in the spirit in this meeting. Ah, <laughs> uh, let's see, something you can't, we can't mess up. It'll be one word, just Jesus, how's that? I used to go to the Catherine Coleman Miracle Services. You ever been to a Catherine Coleman Miracle Service? Oh, that was back in the day. But she'd, uh, she'd come flowing out there. And they'd be singing the classic songs, How Great Thou Art, and He Touched Me. And it was always, uh, and I was like a, kind of like a young, I wasn't a hippie, but I was the hippie generation. I thought it was so strange watching the power of God come in. Because the charismatic movement, unlike the Pentecostal movement, the tent meeting movement, it had a presence about it. In the uh, tent meetings, you had raw power, and most of it was focused on the evangelist. Charismatic movement birthed ex the atmosphere where the sweeping presence of God would come in. So let's sing. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Everyone can do that one. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus.
Jesus, Jesus. Father, I thank you for your presence. The fire and glory tour first night is what we had hoped for, and yet we pray, Lord, there'll be more fire, more glory, more souls. See, tonight was an important night. I know what Mario was thinking. We'll talk about it afterward, but I, you get to know your ministry partners when you work close. And what we wonder is, 80 million, say, f people vote conservative. 80 million people vote for God and for a flag and for fiscal sanity and government restraint and life and various things like that. But uh, from what we know, only 39 to 40 million of those at most are pro-life Catholics and evangelicals. That means there's another 40 million that don't know Jesus that are Republicans. And that's just Republicans. We got lots of independents, we got lots of Democrats, we got half the country doesn't vote. And Mario's meetings already have that crowd. But I was thinking, what would happen if we were to be more intentional about blending the octane? And what would happen if we were to take the rallies like Donald Trump has and see them become revivals like God wants? I was at a Clay Clark Great Awakening event. I think maybe my friend Floyd Brown encouraged me here to do it. And I did this event, and uh, he did something unusual. He said, uh, he, he loved Kim Clement. I travel with Kim a lot. He said, Lance, get up uh, at the end and just uh, to do some healing. And I'll tell you what we did, and we're going to see it here. He said, let's pray for the sick and pray freedom over the people. And I got up there, and Sean Foyt was uh, on the guitar. And I said, and the music was just a little bit too, I don't know, too worshipy. And all of a sudden, I could almost hear Kim Clement in my ear. It's like, play something warfare. I kept hearing warfare, warfare. I said, play something more aggressive. And finally, they started getting a boom, 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 boom. It was some kind of aggressive sound. And uh, I went up there and I said, and it's like I could hear Kim talking in my ear. It was rather strange. He was, it's almost like a prophetic, because you've associated yourself with people, you kind of pick up things from them. And I started just like flowing in like what he would do. I was thinking, you know, he would love an environment like this. I said, every one of you that's suffering from COVID and depression, I almost sounded like you had a South African accent coming through me. Come forward now. And boom, people just stood up and came rushing forward. And I took authority over every spirit of COVID, depression, suicide, distress, we command the healings. And people shouted, they shouted and yelled. It was like a revival impulse took over the room. Now this was like a political rally. And and when it was, and the, the room just pulsated like that, and I was calling for healings, and lady just got her hip healed over here. And I don't always do this, because I, I prefer the whiteboard and news broadcasting, but you do what you gotta do. So I got done doing that, and I thought, oh, this is wild. Uh, a fun experiment. And I go back, and I step off the stage, and I go down there, and I'm standing next to a tall fellow I thought was a security guard. And he said, wow. My dad needs that in his meetings. And I looked over at him, I thought, what, what security guard is this? And he really, t it was Eric Trump. I said, what? He said, I'm telling you, this is what my dad needs in his meetings. I said, oh yes, yeah, so well that would be really good, wouldn't it? But that's when it hit me. That's what we've gotta do. We've gotta begin to see ourselves not as some kind of a church event on the side, we have to see ourselves as the main boulevard of redeeming the United States. And oh, if this succeeds, and what I saw in the altar call here is that the preaching of the gospel, Mario just doing what he normally does, still has a harvest of souls that respond to it because it's still the, it's preaching, I guess it's the evangelist anointing preaching Jesus, it doesn't really matter. Whether it's, whether it's uh, sanctified for your religious tastes or not, he can just go ahead and talk about whatever he wants and God will give him the souls. God will give him the demonstration of healing, deliverance. We will see this. And I believe it's a confirmation that we need to press into more like this. I think 5,000 is the beginning because I think during the day, 
what we want to do is we want to have people that are contemporary thought leaders that are actually going to be coming into our environment. Many of them are Christian, but you know, I'm calling in a lot of the Catholic uh, leaders that I believe really fear God, and I want to see them all get filled with the Holy Spirit. I think Steve Bannon should speak in tongues. <laughs> and so with that thought in mind, I think the whole Trump family should be charismatic, come to think of it. All of them should be, everyone, whosoever will may come. But the vision we have is that these rallies would become, we would have, we would have day and night, powerful, poignant, pungent, prophetic, political. How many P's can I pack into a sentence? We want to see it all happening because I think two or three days with revival and signs and wonders can be the kind of movement that would freak the devil out. I'm always noticing how the left, this is, this is what I noticed. I did one little campaign gig with Doug Mastriano, and I just went up there. Donnie Trump was up there. And I just did one little thing. I said, put your right hand up in the air, the count of three, bring it down, as one, as one. As soon as I put my hand up, immediately Rolling Stone, BuzzFeed, and all these blasphemous belly of the beast bulletins come out saying, Lance Wallnow, leading Doug Mastriano crowd in a Nazi salute. I had the BBC there. They said, they couldn't possibly take this out of context. I said, you watch, they'll take it out of context. Two million liberals read where I had my right hand up doing a Nazi salute. See, they will absolutely lie. And I thought what's ironic about it is I have a Jewish background and come from a long line of rabbis. What kind of schizophrenic Nazi is that? <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Won't stop them. But I do believe that they keep on talking about Christian nationalism. And so we're constantly trying to tool the word. Well, let's not call it Christian nationalism. Let's call it Christian Americanism. Or how about Americanism, period? I don't care what you call it. They're going to slander it. And they're going, so here's the thing you got to think about. The Lord said, you know, this movement will be spoken against. Remember that Bible verse where Jesus is in the temple and the synagogue being circumcised on the eighth day and Simeon comes by, the old prophet who finally has in his hands the fulfillment of the promise prophetically that God showed him years earlier. Now, Lord, let thy servant depart in peace from my eyes have beheld thy servant, uh, you, know, you know, your deliverer. He had the baby in his hands, and he told the mother, Mary, he said, this child shall be for a sign that will be spoken against. I'm telling you, you'll know you're in the move of God when it is labeled and spoken against by all the left-wing press. Will you guys still come out when they do that? Because I guarantee Satan is freaking out, waiting for this movement to come out of the chute. He's been, he's been, he's, he has more faith for it than the Christian church does. He's, I mean, he's always, I'm always dealing with articles about your dominionist, dominionist. I'm not even sure what a dominionist is, but the devil's scared to death we figure out what it is. So here we are tonight, the first of what I believe is a new season of meetings. Now, to be honest with you, there's no Republican that can legally make it into the White House the way that the elections are set up right now. I've done a close analysis of this. The six swing states, Georgia and Arizona and Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, I guess North Carolina, uh, what else? Georgia, thank you. Those states have counties, six counties, that is so tightly wrapped up by the devil that it's virtually impossible for you to see an election go through that grid work and come out honest unless there's a divine intervention. I just want you to know what we're up against. But I suggested to Mario, if we do a fire and glory tour, what I would do is I would want to go to every one of those swing states and I would make it a goal to break down the stronghold over each of those counties. It's a demonic stronghold. It is a demonic stronghold in Fulton County, Georgia, and in Maricopa, Arizona. Maricopa is so obnoxious, they steal it from you twice. So we're not naive. Pentecostals aren't oblivious. We're dangerous. 
because we can function in the spirit realm and the natural realm. This movement will be spoken against, but you get to be part of something in your life that actually is moving. And the only thing I would add to what Mario said is that the Democratic Party has lost its flippin' mind. It's gone totally cultic and weird, unless you're into cross-dressing. But the Republicans are hardly any better. Sorry to say, we've got about seven or eight on-fire Republicans, and the rest of them are like a uniparty. Do you know what... My, my friends have educated me to understand is that, remember I mentioned those six swing states? You can hardly get a, an ele president, a Republican president, or anyone outside the control of the uniparty will ever get elected because those six states are totally wrapped up with six counties that control election engineering. They manipulate the election as well. Uh, here's the problem. In several of those states, like Georgia and Pennsylvania, and even in Arizona, Republicans have the ability to change it, but won't because they're weak and wimpy. Wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. And nobody calls them out. We'll call them out. See, because those weak leaders are messing up your future. Rulers have a responsibility and an accountability to God, and your job is to remind them they're answerable to God, and you're the mechanism God uses to remind them. What happened in the banking community this past week is horrifying. It could trigger a Great Depression. We've got these incompetents that are virtually getting us into a global geopolitical conflict. Who but Biden and the existing nuts in charge of our policy, foreign policy, could make China and Russia become friends. You don't have to be a genius to figure out you don't want your enemies joining together. Russia and China tomorrow are meeting. President Xi and Putin are meeting to create a new global agreement like Russia and Germany during the Second World War to take on the rest of the world. Who did that? Our prevailing current leadership. While we're in a war in Ukraine, the third most corrupt country in the world, and we're pumping billions of dollars into it instead of into the people, in Palestine, Ohio, who had their complete city wiped out by an irresponsible decision to burn killer chemicals? I guess what I'm saying is America needs a truth-telling Holy Spirit movement. It needs it. But the thing Tucker Carlson can't do, the thing Steve Bannon can't do, the thing that... Uh, Dan Bongino can't do it, Hannity can't do it. They can't give you the Holy Ghost, they can't get you saved, and they can't cast out devils. So here's the question. How far are you willing to go to see God save America? Because it's on our watch. This isn't somebody else's. This is our watch right now. And... America's all out of answers. The left doesn't have any. They make things worse. They're now doing a bailout of the banks, which, by the way, means the banks are all being nationalized. The small banks that help entrepreneurs and Christians, which make up some 30 million businesses in America, are losing the ability to stay in business because they're going to collapse it all into a couple of banks, a couple of woke big corporations, which is going to try to annihilate all of the individuals that have their own businesses, small business, credit lines are gonna get messed up. And this is all kind of part of, I don't think it's a plan, I, just th I think it's incompetence, but I think the devil knows what he's doing. These people we're up against aren't that bright, they keep on making dumb mistakes, but there's a sinister intelligence working through their bad decisions. And we have to interrupt it. I don't believe that America is destined for judgment. I think America is destined for divine intervention. But I will tell you this, we're meeting in an unusual time. Some ambitious, corrupt DA in New York has decided he wants to arrest Donald Trump on Tuesday while we're here. The banking system is melting down on your way here. 
Ukraine, like I said, they're, they're having a geopolitical decision on advancing on a war footing over there. The only thing that can arrest this is the Jesus that saved America and saved you. The only thing that can arrest it is the same power that brought a divine healing to those of you that stood up. The same power that you're, many of you are going to go home and find out the migraine's gone, the pain isn't there. We have people that come back by day two lining up. The numbers are even greater by day two because they realize they actually got healed. It's going to have to be supernatural. How many believe God is able to save America? How many of you are convinced the answer won't come on a political party? That's what the midterms convinced me of. I thought for sure we'd see a red wave. Thank God I didn't prophesy it, but I just thought we would. But then I realized after that happened that the glory of God's government doesn't advance on a political platform or an ox cart, but it advances on the shoulders of Levites. The glory of that ark advances on the church. But it'll have to be a different kind of church. It'll have to be a fire and glory church. It's going to have to be a church that is, that is spiritually awakened and civically engaged. And you have to own the anointing in the territory you live in and bring that territory under the authority of Christ. You have to make your territorial spirits obey Jesus. And that may sound like strange preaching, but get used to it. Because you have authority over the spirit in your territory. And pockets of revival and awakening are going to break out in America in specific geographic locations. I can predict that. In every great awakening, it's pockets and territories that have awakening. Now, we just went through this banking meltdown thing. I told Mari I wanted to come up here for one reason. Because I want to do something spiritual as a weapon during this window when the economy of America is under attack. The last time I saw a, a, a moment like this was with Miles Monroe, while before he had, uh, he had died, Miles Monroe was taking an offering at a business conference. I think I was in Hawaii at the time. And it was the most unusual offering. It was 2008. And he was talking to all these business people about what was coming in the financial distress. And he gave this word. He said, you're going to need God to protect you, your business, and your finances in the coming season. And because there is a crisis starting now, now is the time to sow supernaturally into the window of God so that your seed and your statement is here now for God to see as you go through the next season. You're literally going to sow so that God is watching over what pertains to you as the nation goes through an adjustment. I remember that. I was sitting over there on the, on the front row. And I thought, Lord, where is that in the Bible? Where is that where God told him not to run, not to leave? And I remembered it was the 26th chapter of Genesis. Now there was a famine in the land beside the previous famine. Another cycle hit besides a previous cycle that hit. And uh, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not leave, do not run to the world system, do not be in fear, don't go to Egypt, which is a type of the world. But stay exactly in the place that you're in right now. Sojourn here in the land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give these lands. I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I'm going to multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. So Isaac sowed in that land. And the Bible says, in that land he reaped in the same year when the famine hit a hundredfold and God blessed him. Let me say now, when we're sowing into something God is doing. We're planting something into the anointing that will go to work for you and war against the spirit that would destroy you. This ministry of Mario's is an evangelist ministry. I'm taking up the offering for my friend tonight, not for me, not for us, but for his ministry. Because when he's doing his job, He's evangelizing, and the irony is the more effective you are with evangelizing, 
the less people are accustomed to supporting your ministry, which makes sense because they've never done it before. That means coming out of Bakersfield to come here, he's actually coming having invested in Bakersfield, which means that the harvest that was there wasn't paying for the evangelist any more than a missionary's audience pays for the missionary. But tonight we're going to do something special. I want to receive an anointing for the Fire and Glory Tour. I want to receive it for Mario Murillo Ministries. I want to receive it for the work of a Great Awakening Evangelism anointing. And I want to do it also with this mentality that I want a statement to be made before the fear and anxiety and confusion of economic stories hits you leaving here. Put a seed into the ground and say, God, I trust you. I believe you. You're going to take care of me in the next season as you've taken care of me in the past. I am sowing into this soil, even in a time when there could be famine, I believe you can cause me to reap a hundredfold. So here's what I want you to do. If you, uh, you guys have a, do you have a way that you could bring up an image right now for me? If you have a phone, you can text to give. The tech savvy folks can text to MMM right there. Here. Donate by text, simply send MMM to 91999. MMM is conveniently Mario Murillo Ministries. MMM, text 91999. And uh, if you want to donate by check or cash, put your hand up and we'll give you an envelope. We have an envelope for you. All you've got to do with the envelope is put your email address on it and your name. And if you want to write something you want us to be praying for, put that on the envelope. We're going to give you a white envelope. And you can put your cash in there. You can put your uh, email address, your name, and any prayer requests that you have. And those that are especially capable of handling Donate online. You can use the, uh, the unusual, what's it called again? QR code. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. See all the ca cameras going up? You guys are doing that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. While we're doing this, go ahead and fill out uh, checks. How many, anyone else need envelopes? All right. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. If you're not ready, say, hold on. We need more envelopes. Do we have more envelopes? If you're writing a check, you don't need an envelope. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I believe. I believe that there's spirits that are going to be leaving you tonight and not tormenting you when you leave. I believe the Lord is going to be visiting you. Many of you with dreams. This is one of the most dreamiest places I've ever been. I had more dreams in Ocala. Because the Spirit of the Lord is really opening something up over this place. All right. Now, do we have the, uh, our team ready? Still need a few more envelopes? All right, put your hand up if you still need an envelope. I love how you guys sang earlier. Let's see how you do with this one. Hallelujah. 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 
Let's sing it. Alleluia. 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 Hallelujah. What a presence, huh? Lord, we thank you for tonight's offering. We thank you that you're the one that's watching over your people. Your church is your enterprise. We believe that you will rebuke the devourer for our sake and that everyone who has participated tonight, be it small or be it large, that your spirit is hovering over them and their family to watch over them. We pray, save this nation. Cause it to have a surge of your glory. Let revival rock it. Let awakening shake it. Let reformation change it. Raise up in every mountain, in media, in education, in arts and entertainment, in law and in business, in every field of endeavor, in pulpits and campuses and schools, we pray, in government, municipal, local, state and national, raise up your great awakening, great reformation voices. We pray now in Jesus' name, release the battery of that which you've held in reserve. Release the great reserve into the battle to turn America to God again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Reveal your fire and reveal your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Mario, come on back up, my brother. You guys can pass the offering so everyone gets a chance to participate. Let's welcome Mario Murillo back. Glory, glory, glory. You know, uh, thank you for giving, folks. This, this has been an amazing night. Uh, I think we are well organized in the parts that matter. And we're going to get organized in every part. But didn't Lance do a wonderful job sharing up here with that? <laughs> tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., right here, it's not going to, this glory is going to just get stronger. It's going to be stronger tomorrow morning than it is right now because that's the way he works. And I don't know if we're still giving, but I, I believe people are, and I, I want to facilitate that. Thank you so much. This has got to be one of the best audiences I've ever had in my life. Uh, you, you all are amazing. So if you, if you have given or if you're continuing to give, please do so. But we're going to tell you that you have to understand that this is all overflow. We're in an overflow of the Spirit. The, how many of you know the altar call was an overflow? The attendance tonight was an overflow. The miracles were an overflow. And now many of you, this has been a wonderful offering for which I thank God. I thank God. And... Believe me, I am grateful to you. So if you've already given, would you stand right now? And uh, if you've, st if it, let me put it this way. If the bucket went past you, please stand up. I don't want anyone to think they had to give anything to be in that uh, group. I'm sorry. To God be the glory for everything he has done tonight. <laughs> to God be the glory. I have a new book out called It's Our Turn Now. And it's available in the back. And I've already autographed it for you. So if you'd like to get a copy, I just want to remind you of that. Bow your heads a moment. We not only give you the glory, Lord, 
We don't feature anyone but you. You are the source of all of our joy, all of our peace. As we leave from this place, everyone will be home safe. And bring us back tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for the next phase of fire and glory to be seen that will spread across America. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. We'll see you in the morning.